Hello, uh, my name is Ronnie Shawair. I'm currently a third year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. And today I'm really excited to talk to you about our work that we recently presented at the Internet Measurement Conference. And this was joint work with my co-advisors, Justine Sherry and Trini Sation, as well as uh, Matt McCurgy, who is now at Nefeli. So this work is on modeling BBR's interactions with loss-based congestion control algorithms. So you're probably wondering, why am I trying to model Google's new congestion control algorithm BBR with loss-based algorithms? Well, I want to answer this seemingly simple question, which is BBR, specifically BBR version 1, fair to legacy loss-based congestion control algorithms? In the past, uh, there's been a bunch of work trying to answer this question using empirical measurement. So we saw an example of this in Google's early presentations on BBR, where they showed that BBR is fair to cubic in networks with very large queues. So this is a reproduction of some of their findings. Uh, on this graph, I'm showing you on the y-axis the good put and on the x-axis is time for one cubic flow competing with one BBR flow. And here the bottleneck queue size is quite big, it's 32 BDP. And here we can see that one cubic flow here after convergence is getting about 60% of the, the available bandwidth, while the one BBR flow is getting about 40%. So here BBR is more than fair to cubic. But we showed in a poster at NSDI 2018 that BBR can actually be unfair to cubic in the same scenarios. So here in this graph, it's the same scenario, but now instead of one cubic flow, I have 16 cubic flows competing with just one BBR flow. But the allocation of throughput is the same. So each cubic flow here is getting less than 4% of the, of the available bandwidth while the one BBR flow still gets 40%. Yikes, okay, that seems really bad. Um, so we really want to understand what's going on here. But unfortunately, the prior work does not clearly explain why we see these behaviors. So we ask in our paper and in this work, can we explain these results? So in the past, we've seen we can use modeling to understand how different congestion control algorithms uh, would impact their sending rate. And uh, we've seen that with the Mathis equation and the Padhai equation, which showed TCP Reno's throughput relationship to the loss rate. So we ask, can we build a model similar to, to those that can help us understand BBR's interactions with loss-based algorithms? And the answer to that question turns out to be yes, of course. And at the bottom here of uh, the slide, I'm showing you how um, our I'm showing you our robust model for BBR's fraction of the link and throughput when it's competing with loss-based flows. Now this uh, formula looks somewhat complicated, but really what I want you to draw your attention to here is that none of these variables depend on the number of loss-based flows. So that is why we see unfairness in, our, in the previous uh, results I showed you. So in order to understand what's going on here, let's begin by talking about how BBR works so then we can understand how we build the model. So BBR is intended to be a rate-based algorithm. It wants to figure out exactly how much available bandwidth uh, is its fair share is available and send pacing packets at that rate. So how does B BBR figure out its sending rate? Well, in steady state, it uses a mechanism called probe bandwidth. So BBR is basically going to send it what it currently thinks is the maximum throughput it can get. Let's say that's a rate R for six RTTs. Then it's going to see, can I put more data into the network and get better throughput? So it's going to send at a 20, uh, at 1.25 times R, so 25% more, for one RTT. And it's going to see if it gets better throughput. 
finally is going to reduce to its new sending rate, whatever it thinks its new maximum throughput it can get is um, in the following RTT. So in total, BBR is going to see what maximum throughput it can get over these steps that take about eight RTTs. And BBR will repeat these steps over and over again. So let's walk through an example of what this looks like in practice. Imagine, as I often do, that you are Michelle Obama. You are at home trying to watch YouTube, which uses BBR for congestion control. Your home access link is super, super slow, so it's the bottleneck link here. So when I refer to the bottleneck link or the bottleneck queue, this is what I'm talking about. You're at the at-home router here and the queue inside of it. So in order to figure out how much bandwidth is available, BBR, while it's sending data, is going to keep track of the largest throughput it's seen over an 8RTT window. So in steady state, it's just going to send at this rate. So in this example, the link capacity is 10 megabits per second. And let's say some other flows were coming and going. Maybe Michelle was browsing the web also. And so now BBR's best throughput so far that it thinks it can get is 9 megabits per second. So it's sending at this rate. So during pro bandwidth, again for one RTT, BBR is going to increase its steady state sending rate by 25% to see if it can get more throughput. In this example, that means BBR will increase its rate to about 11.25 megabits per second. But obviously that's over the link capacity, right? Which is only 10 megabits per second. So BBR is only going to see that it can get 10 megabits per second, but that was higher than it got before. So that's going to be its new sending rate. So we can see that when BBR is alone, Pro bandwidth allows BBR to both maximize throughput and minimize delay by figuring out exactly how much bandwidth is, is available. But what happens during pro bandwidth when competing with Reno or Cubic? So let's say Barack is now also home, but he's watching Netflix, which uses Reno for congestion control. So imagine Reno is currently using 90% of the link and getting a throughput of 9 megabits per second. And let's say BBR is using the rest of the link, so it's sending at 1 megabit per second, so it's getting about 10% of the link. So now the link and the queue are full here. So now when BBR increases its sending rate, it's going to try to increase its rate from 1 megabit per second to 1.25 megabits per second. But again, I'm now over capacity, so BBR is going to cause packet loss during pro bandwidth. And since Reno is a loss-based algorithm, it's going to cut its congestion window in half, reducing its utilization, let's say that makes it now using about 45% of the link. And despite some losses, BBR is going to see that it can get a higher throughput. Let's say it's about 1.21 megabits per second. So it's now using 12% of the link, which is more than it was using before. So while Reno has backed off, BBR's new sending rate is greater than what it was before. So even though now the link is underutilized, Reno can't possibly reclaim all of the bandwidth it had before, right? It, it can increase its window um, until it experiences loss, but the maximum utilization it can have now is about 88%. So as we can see, BBR's pro bandwidth phase is going to cause Reno and Cubic to back off. So we can visualize this in our empirical results. So this graph is showing the uh, first half of a plot. Um, the y-axis is the number of packets in the queue. Uh, and the blue line here is cubic, while the green line is BBR. So we see here that cubic is backing off while BBR is putting more and more packs into the queue. And this is what's happening during each pro bandwidth phase. We can also visualize this um, in another way here on the right. So on the x-axis here is cubic's fraction of the Q, and on the y-axis is BBR's fraction of the Q. So if cubic occupies P fraction of the Q, to occupy the rest of the Q, BBR must have about 1 minus P data in flight, right? Just the rest of the Q, which is illustrated here as the blue line. So if we start at the point where cubic has most of the Q, as we see in this figure on the left, BBR is able to move up this blue line during pro bandwidth, updating its bottleneck bandwidth estimate 
putting more and more packets into the queue as Cubic backs off. So given what we know about BBR so far, and how it uses probe bandwidth to figure out its sending rate, Shouldn't BBR just keep going into probe bandwidth, putting more and more packs into the queue, essentially moving up this blue line until Cubic uh, essentially has no packets in the queue and is nearly starved? Well, no, that's not what we see in our empirical results. So here I've uh, revealed the second half of this graph, and it looks like BBR stops at some point. So what exactly is stopping BBR here? Why isn't probe bandwidth just allowing BBR to consume the entire link? So we really had to go digging to figure out what's stopping probe bandwidth here. You know, what is it? And one sentence in the BBR white paper uh, by Google revealed the answer, and I've highlighted it for you here. So it turns out BBR limits the amount of data in flight to 2 BDP, which is essentially a safety mechanism in case of delayed and stretched acts to make sure that BBR can still utilize the full available bandwidth. So there's just this one little section here about this minor implementation detail, um, but surprisingly, the safety mechanism, this minor implementation detail, completely dictates BBR's link fraction under competition. And this is extremely surprising for us. So this leads to our key insight, that under competition, BBR is not rate limit. It is window limited because of this in-flight cap. So if we can figure out how to model the in-flight cap, we can model BBR's throughput. So we need to add this in-flight cap to our model. And it turns out that it's this green parabola. So let's discuss how we derive this. Assume here we're going to make really simplifying assumptions that we have one BBR flow versus one cubic flow, and that we're in a network where the queue size is very, very large. So in the example I've been showing you so far, this is um, a 32 BDP queue. So it's very, very large. Okay, so let's define some variables. So here we have the bottleneck link capacity is C, and the bottleneck Q size is Q, um, illustrated here at the top as well. And the P fraction of the bottleneck Q is occupied by cubic. And we're just gonna assume the rest of the Q is occupied by BBR, right? Super simple. So what exactly is two BDP in our model? So what is this in-flight cap? Well, the bandwidth here is just going to be equal to BBR's fraction of the link, uh, of, of the queue. Uh, so that's, its fraction of the queue is equal to its fraction of the link, so its bandwidth estimate is just going to be 1 minus P times C. But what about its RTT estimate? Well, it turns out uh, BBR's RTT estimate is essentially equal to how much data the competition cubic has in the queue, which is P times Q. Uh, oh, and then over C, so how long it takes that data to drain from the queue. So I don't, I'm not going to go into all of the details about this derivation. Please refer to our paper, which is linked in the description, to um, see all of the details of how we get this. But basically, you uh, can plug in the bandwidth estimate, the RTT estimate, into the in-flight cap formula and reduce. And it turns out it is indeed this green parabola. So again, going back to our previous example, we can move up this blue line, but eventually the amount of data in flight equals BBR's in-flight cap. So it can't put any more data in flight. And that happens to be when BBR has half of the queue. So one BBR flow can get up to half of the queue in the link when there's a two BDP in flight cap. And uh, our model prediction then is it can get half of the queue, which is shown here as this uh, black dashed line. And we see in our empirical results, this is confirmed. We see that BBR gets about half of the queue here. We further validate this model by actually changing the in flight cap in a, a Linux implementation of BBR. And we changed the in-flight cap to 4 BDP. This required changing about two lines of code. And here, 
we see that because we now have a four BDP cap, our model would say BBR should get about three fourths of the Q, which it does. So you can see here that this in-flight cap essentially determines what BBR's fraction of the Q and fraction of the link is going to be when it's competing with loss based flows. So I made a lot of simplifying model uh, assumptions when I was talking about this model, but our paper has a more robust model of BBR's in-flight cap. We um, add in a lot of the um, parameters that we sort of ignored in the simple model. But what I want you to notice here is that I've highlighted all of the variables that impact BBR's fraction of the link and its throughput. And again, I want to draw your, fact, your attention to the fact that none of these variables depend on either the loss rate or the number of loss base flows. So BBR does not care about how many loss base flows it's competing with. So um, lastly, our model predicts BBR's throughput pretty well when it's competing against cubic flows with a median area of 5% and the, area, uh, the error for Reno is about 8%. So please see our paper for all of the details about the more robust model and um, errors and everything. But what I want you to take away from this talk is that when BBR competes with other traffic, it's basically window limited and because of this in-flight cap, and that the in-flight cap, which determines its rate, does not depend on the number of competing loss base flows. Thank you. And please go read our paper, which is linked in the description.